All right, so last yesterday in session one, we've been, we've been talking about our identity as believers. And in the last session, we focused on the new birth. And it was a good place to start because the new birth is critical to our identity. Okay, we are not sinners, we are righteous. And that righteousness is made possible by the new birth. And because we are born again, the old man that was under the law is dead. Okay? And there is a new man who is reborn, who is not under the law. The law was ended. And so where there is no law, there is no sin. And no sin means no condemnation. And there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation because we cannot sin. Okay. No, I did not sin today because I am born again. Okay. He who is born of God does not sin because he cannot sin. And this is the reality that's made possible by the new birth. And we saw how the Apostle John even made that very same point in the book of 1 John. And we spoke a little bit on this contrast of the old versus the new. And I want to elaborate some more on that, on that contrast in this session this morning. In fact, a good, a good part of this session is going to be spent looking at that contrast in a little bit more detail as it pertains to our identity. Who we are as believers. Uh, believers need to understand who they are. And the reason being so that they can live a rich and fulfilling life in, for, uh, uh, a rich and fulfilling life for God the Father, serving others, loving others, showing love to God and others, becoming equipped to do the task that God gave for us gave us to do. And what is that task? It's to go out and to make disciples, to make learners. That's why God left us here. Okay? It doesn't mean you know, it doesn't make sense that if we're going to go out and try to teach others to become believers, we ought to know what it means in the first place, right? I mean, how can we tell somebody what it means to be a believer if we don't even know. You, you, you talk about having an identity crisis. That certainly describes the state of most Christians sitting in churches these days. So in the last session, we, we talked about the new birth. And so by extension, it only makes sense that we talk about the new man. And what is the new man? And I think if we ended our study right now, Regarding the new man, we could simply conclude that the new man is that which exists by virtue of the new birth. Right? You know, we, uh, the old man died, and a new man was born in his place. That new man was born of God. And that was the original assumption I had when I began going into this study, preparing for this conference, you know, that was always the original assumption, assumption that the new man refers to the, 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 the new from the new birth, that which was born again. In fact, uh, to some extent, Protestant reform orthodoxy at least pays lip service to this notion of the new man. And that's what they would have most of the laity buy into we know, of course, that their notion of the new man is nothing more than a realm or a new way of seeing things differently. So it's not an actual literal change that takes place in someone. So we have this notion of the new man being the, whoop, being the new creature that Paul referred to here in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature... Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The new creature is the new man that is born of God. And that's the natural assumption. That we see other, and we see other places in the New Testament where we have this contrast of the old and the new, the putting off the old, the putting on the new. And the assumption is in this context of the, 
new born again man who is a believer. But as I looked more closely at some of these passages, I began to see a different context. And I realized that there's a lot more going on here. Paul is talking about something much more than just the new birth of the individual. So let's get into this. Let's begin by looking at this contrast again, and we'll begin again with the old man. And so if you recall from my last session, when we referred to this verse here, 2 Corinthians 5.17, we looked at this expression, old things. Old things. Old things are passed away. And we saw that the word for old was not the most common word used in the New Testament. There was a different word that Paul used here for old and old things. And that was the Greek word archaea. Archaea. And archaea means original, that which was from the beginning, the former, previous. We said this was not the old that has to do with respect to age, but it was a comparison word. Like, he left his old job, his old high school, his old girlfriend. Okay, It means former or previous. So Paul uses this, this word old to make a comparison between the former and that which replaces it. The old man, the former man, is replaced with the new man or that which is different from before. But now we get to passages like these. <laughs> Romans 6.6, 6. knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And then there's Ephesians 4.22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And then the other... Uh, reference that I have is Colossians 3 9 lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and all of a sudden now in these verses the perspective changes because now while we have Paul making a ref a specific reference to the old man once again he does not use that word archaea from 2 Corinthians 5 17 he uses the other word we talked about yesterday, and that word was pa palios. I keep hitting the wrong button. There we go. Palios. Palios means antique or not recent or worn out. Okay? Uh, we get the word paleontology from this. Okay? This is the old that has to do with respect to age. And this is the word that's used in each one of these verses here. In the context of these passages, Paul is actually talking to and referring to an old man, not the former. Okay, this is the old in the sense that something has suffered the effects of time. It has become run down and worn out, like a rusty old car. Okay? And there is there's some significance to that to that if you if you use that analogy. And because it's old and worn out, it's got to be replaced. Okay? At some point, you know, that rusty old car is going to get so worn out that you simply can't keep it roadworthy anymore. You know, you, it needs more than just replacing an engine. Talk or... about my Cadillac again. <laughs> the Bronco. The, the Bronco. <laughs> okay, at, you know, at some point, you know, it's going to get so worn out that it, you just can't maintain it anymore. Okay? Um, it needs more than just a new engine or a new coat of paint or putting new brakes on it or replacing the exhaust, okay? You just got to get rid of the thing, okay? And so in this context, this is what Paul means when he refers to this old man, the man that's under the law, okay? He's, he is talking about more than just the former or the previous. When he calls him an old man, he means just that, Okay? It's old, okay? It's, it's worn out. It can't be maintained. It, it, it is, in this sense, corrupt. You can't just restore it. You can't rehab it. 
It is old and there's no use for it. The only thing you can do with it is get rid of it and replace it. And this is a description of every person alive who has not been born again. The old man is not just old in the sense of that which was previous, but in its most basic sense, it's just that. It's old. In fact, we could go so far as to say it's dead. Or it's as good as dead. It's not good for much of anything else. And isn't that exactly what Paul was saying in Ephesians 2.1? You know, what he said, you were dead in trespasses and sins. So this old man is exactly that. It's old. It's more than just a reference to the former man, but that former man is indeed old in the sense of age. So how does this compare with the new man? Well, we have some verses that use this expression, the new man. <coughs> Ephesians 2.15 Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And then there's Ephesians 4.24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And a second reference there in Ephesians, this is a direct contrast in the context with the old man. And I didn't put this in the slide, but if you've got your Bible, if you look in your Bibles and you go back up to verse 22, Ephesians 4.22, it reads, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, we just looked at that in the previous slide, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this is familiar to us. You know, we've heard lessons on this before. We've, the, the putting off the old man, the putting on the new. But what's interesting is that in both of these passages is that the word for new is the same word that was used in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Now stay with me here, touch, follow, follow with me on this. The word new is the word kainos. This is not new with respect to age. Remember the word that was used, palios, is with respect to age. But he's contrasting it here with the word new that is not with respect to age. This is with respect to freshness. Or difference. This is that comparative word again. Okay, you remember in 2 Corinthians 5.17, the two words, the old, the word for old and the word for new were comparative words. But here in these references, old is the word with respect to age, but he's still using the same word, kainos, which is the comparative word. Okay, it indicates a replacement or something different. And you remember the examples I used. I said, he got a new job, you know, he's going to a new school, he has a new girlfriend. We understand that in this context, new means it's a replacement. It doesn't speak to its age. And I find it interesting here, and perhaps I'm reading more into this than I should, but... Um, You know, I've come to learn that words mean things. You know, and, and Paul says this often. You know, words mean things. And I think we should trust the authors when they that they use the words that they use and take them for what they mean in a plain sense. But notice that again, while he uses the comparative term for new, he did not use the comparative term for old. He didn't use archaea, he used paleos. So let me make this clear once again. In, in, when he referenced the old man, he referenced the old man in terms of age, but he references the new man in terms of replacement. Now before I go too far and read more into this than we should, let me point out one more reference. And I'm going to show you the previous verse with it so that you can see the contrast. 
Colossians 3, 9, and 10. Colossians 3, 9, and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, that's the word palios, and have put on the new, and notice that the word man there is in brackets or italics in your Bible, because the word man is not in the Greek text. And have put on the new, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. But once again, we have this word palios for old. The old man referenced in terms of age. In verse 10, we also have this reference to the new, but there's a different word used here in the Greek in this verse. And this is the word neos. Neos. Now, neos is the word that has to do with age. That's a reference to age. It means recent or young or vital or lively. You get this idea of being full of life, living. Okay? All right? Not corrupted. You know, some examples of this might be he got a new car. Okay, he opened up a new ream of paper. You know, he sharpened a new pencil. You know, in those examples, you kind of get that age aspect with that. We've got these examples with respect to age. And so let me be clear in our understanding of the difference of these words. I want to show you how both of these words are used in another familiar passage. And you've, you're familiar with this one. This is Matthew 9, 17. Jesus is, t Jesus is speaking. He says, Neither do men put new wine, that's the word neos, into old bottles, that's the word palios, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine, that's the word neos, into new bottles. Bottles, that's the word kainos, replacements. And both are preserved. Okay? And, I, and again, like I said, I put this up here to help you see the difference between these two words, neos and kainos, so we can see it in context and get a better understanding. The usage helps us understand the meaning. So why, why, do, I, why do we have all that? Why am I spending all this time talking about old and new? Um... Because I think there's something to the fact of the words that Paul used here. He refers to the old man not as the previous or the former man, but as an actual worn out and dying old man. And that's indeed an accurate description of an unsaved person. One who is still under the law, one who is unsaved, he's an old man. And isn't it interesting that the Protestant Reformed Orthodoxy still keeps believers in that same state, keeping believers under the law as an old man, not as a former man, but an old man. And isn't that what we hear? You remember those memes I showed you yesterday? Okay. I need Christ because I'm weak and I need a Savior. Okay. I'm an old man. I'm not a perfect Christian. All right, you think about the implications of that. So there's some significance to this reference of an, of an old man, but then this old man is replaced with something, and this happens at the new birth. A new man is born, born of God, a new creature who cannot sin because there is no law, but there is something even deeper in these verses. Is Paul just talking about being born again when he's talking about the new man here? I want to look at these new man references again, but I'm going to put them up here in a larger context. I want you to see these verses in the passages where they appear. Okay? Follow this with me. I don't know if you can see how well you can see this on the video. But if you're following along, this is Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 11 through 22. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, 
that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off, that means at one time, at one point, you were far away. Ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished the flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, growing unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, I've highlighted some key phrases and some words in this passage, and if you're putting those pieces together, you might begin to see where I'm going with this, but before you jump the gun on this, or if you're still not clear, let's look at the next passage. And this one's a little longer, so please bear with me on this. Those of you, I, again, if you're watching this on the video, um, you probably can't see, the, can't see the slides. But this is Ephesians 4, and I'm going to take the time here and go through verses 4 through 32. So Ephesians 4, 4 through 32. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And let's skip on to verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Okay? And that's another way of referring to faith in Christ. Or, as you remember from our study in the book of Acts, the way. Christians were known as followers of the way. So this expression here, unity of the faith, is another way of referring to being a believer. Okay? Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have learned him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, 
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay. Now, I know that's a lot of reading, okay, but I've got one more. Here's the last one. This one's not so long. This is Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Remember, I'm taking these passages, these verses that we looked at, that was talking about the old man versus the new man, and I'm putting it in context, in the larger context, so we can understand what is Paul talking about with regard to the new man when it comes to the larger context. Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked at one time, when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, which is nothing more than speaking evil, talking, talking evil about something, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, because you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, Circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, let's catch our breath. Hopefully, by now, I hope you can see where I'm going with this. Because in all of these passages, there's a recurring theme. Yes, we've got the old man versus the new man, but there is a context that is common to all of these passages. Anyone have an idea what that is? And I know I'm looking for a specific answer here. So I'm hoping I'm not playing, guess what I'm thinking. Okay? But in all of those passages that I just read, that we just looked at, does anybody see the common theme that's running through these passages? Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, you mean... Change of the believer. Um, <clears throat> In general, the ability of the believer to be changed from a sinful state to a to a non sinful state. Or Th that's true, but uh, okay. Let me say. Let me let me try to say this again. The context of the old man versus the new man. Okay. When Paul is talking about the new man, in the context of these passages, he's talking about something else. <laughs> and and, I, and what. what what was the what was the context that Paul is that the, the what, I guess what's the contrast that Paul is making in these passages? I guess maybe I'm playing. Guess Wait, what? No, was he talking about the law? Or, I'm, I'm sorry. What? Was he talking about like the change of law from when before Jesus came and after? Well, I mean that certainly has some. That is that that's certainly part of it. You need to understand though, and for us, we're never asked about in our in our. Former reform lives, mm -hmm. we're never asked about context. Okay. Because context, as Paul will elaborate on in terms of uh, his talking, uh, context is immaterial. Mm -hmm. So for you to ask, well, what's the context? That's that's an anathema. <laughs> the when, I, when, I, when I look biblically, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this stuff has a context. And, but, I, and that's but, why my brain's going tilt. The context is always justification. Mm -hmm. 
So you never have to ask what the context right. is. Right. Right. Justification right. is assumed. But he has a specific context in right. mind, and, right. and, but that's, that's true. And, and mm -hmm. so that's why my brain's going tilt, because I'm like, okay, I actually have to think critically about yeah. the Bible now. So if I put these, so if I, if I go back to this first one here, if I go back to this first reference, and I'm, I'm trying to, I've underlined some of these phrases and words to try and pull out the context. Yeah. Okay? Because the context, is, because these are the key phrases, hath made both one, making himself of twain one new man, one body, we both have access, fellow citizens with the saints, all the building, are all builded together. Okay? And within that context, we saw our verse, we saw of our verse, where is it now? One new man. Here's, the, here's where we see the new man. Okay? Within the context of this larger passage, we have all these key phrases, hath made both one, making himself of twain one. We both have access. Okay? Same thing here in Ephesians. Okay? Um, here we have the contrast, the old man and the new man. We are members one of another. Unity of the faith, a perfect man, okay, whole body, okay, the body unto the edifying of itself, okay, I, is, now, is it, is it a little bit more clear, now? do you see kind of where I'm going with this, okay, so, what is the context then here, the context is, The body of Christ. Okay? The body of Christ. You know, and all those other things you guys mentioned were critical too. Okay? You know, um, but the one body, okay, the unity, okay, how does Paul refer to the body of Christ in these passages? When he talks about one body, he refers to it as the new man. Okay? So the new man in, these, in the context of these verses is not a reference to the new creature. It's not a reference to the born-again believer specifically. Okay? Even though that is true, even though we are new creatures as a result of the new birth, the new man that Paul is referencing in these passages is the body of Christ. And he even said, Christ is the head. Okay, so you see, what happens is, when we're born again, we are not only a new creature that has been resurrected to, do, to new life, but we are placed into a body. A new body. We become part of the new man. And that new man is the body of Christ. Okay, um, and look at one last contrast in these larger passages. You know, the old man. The old man is reference to what we used to be individually. Okay? Each one of us was an old man. You know, he was corrupt, he was dying, he was not able to be fixed, and he needed to be replaced. He wasn't good for anything. And those who are those who are still this old man, you know, look at what characterizes them. You know, all these things were mentioned in those passages. Without Christ, you know, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the promise, having no hope, um, children tossed to and fro, alienated from God, blind in the heart, past feeling got this whole list and we could go on and on and on. This is the old man. This is why he is old. This is why he is worn out. He has all of these things corrupting him, killing him. Okay, he's like that rusty old car. Okay? You can't fix it. me. <laughs> you know, okay, you can't fix this stuff. All right? Giving him a new coat of paint isn't going to fix it. OK? 
Okay, you know, replacing the head gasket's not going to fix it. There's too much. There's too much wrong here. Okay, and guess what? When a person believes in Christ, that old man and all these problems that he has dies. If you are made a, if you are a believer, that man with all these problems is dead. And you have been reborn. And when you are reborn, not only are you a new creature, not only have you been replaced, not only what is there has not only has what has been there been replaced, but you are put into a new spiritual body, the body of Christ, the new man. You are part of a body that is completely different from anything that ever was. Okay? For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. Galatians 3, 27 and 28. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This was the mystery that Paul was talking about. The new man that was hidden from the Old Testament saints. They knew nothing about this. The prophets and the Old Testament saints, they knew nothing about this. This was the mystery that Paul was talking about. This was not revealed until after Christ. Okay? It was revealed to the apostles during these last days when God began to do a work showing Israel that, yes, salvation is of the Jews, but God was going to make eternal life available to all men everywhere. And from now on, there is no such thing as Jew or Greek. Your identity isn't your nationality anymore. You're not identified as being either a bondservant or a master. You are now a part of the new man. All people everywhere who put their faith in Christ, no matter who they are, this was God's intention, to make them one body with Christ as the head. And since you are a body, you ought to function as a body, right? You know, we saw the contrast of those passages. Paul said, you're all part of this body, you ought to act like it. And this goes back to the love thing that we were talking about last night. The body can't be healthy if its various parts are all fighting with each other and treating each other improperly, okay? If they're tearing each other down, he says, Paul says, stop doing those things. He says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, stop lying to each other. That was characteristic of the old man. You guys have to stop doing those things. You're part of this new man now. You're all part of this body. Okay? Build each other up. Don't tear each other down. Edify each other. Strengthen each other. Be kind and tender-hearted to each other. Now, let's not have any misunderstanding here, because many have pointed to this very teaching about the body, and they like to use it to support the uh, collectivist mentality. And so, Paul is not act advocating collectivism here, by no stretch of the imagination. If you study Paul's teachings uh, elsewhere carefully, um, especially the whole section, you, go, you look at 1 Corinthians and you go through, read chapters 12 through 14, and it's this whole treatise on how to use spiritual gifts. Paul is very careful to stress the importance of the individual in that passage. And if we're honest with ourselves when we read that context, we can see that. But in these last two passages here, we have this same sentiment as expressed in Colossians 3, of all of us being immersed into this one body in Christ, the new man, but he also says, yes, we're many members. 
There's, there's many members. Okay? And, you know, in, in, like I said, I made reference to 1 Corinthians 12. You know, he goes on to teach the proper use of spiritual gifts and how each individual has his own gift that was given to them for the purpose of building up this body, building each other up. So, yes, our identity is found in the, in the body of Christ, and it comes by way of each of us using our gifts as it was meant to be used, each of us performing the function as we should, because we each have a function in the body. No one is any more or less important than the other. We aren't all eyes. We aren't all hands. We aren't all feet. We all aren't kidneys. You know, uh, kidneys not a very attractive body part, is it? But it, you know, but it's just as vital. Okay, and in fact, in First Corinthians twelve, Paul even says we should give extra honor to those members whose functions might seem less attractive to us. And guess what? If the body is healthy and strong, doesn't that make each individual member of the body healthy and strong as well? So we've talked about our identity in the new birth. We've talked about our identity in the new man. And in my last session tomorrow, we'll examine a few more other aspects of the believer's identity I have several more that I want to cover, but uh, I'm not going to go nearly as in-depth as I did with these two, so we should be able to get through each of those rather quickly. So, questions, comments, anything to add? It's just us. It's just us. No, I was going to say, I think uh, this is very interesting, because you know whether uh, people agree or disagree, um, what they can't fault you with, being very thorough, and uh, being very uh, true to the Bible, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the criticisms that uh, that the truth about New Calvinism as an organization and, and its uh, contributors get is that they're not biblical. And I think bringing you on board has proven that to be completely a specious argument. Um, you are nothing if not extremely biblically literate. And more so than any, uh, as much or more so than any uh, perform person I've ever met. And I was in SGM, a Sovereign Grace Ministries, for 15 years. And, uh, uh, you know, so y y your presence here just, just proves that, that uh, criticism to be false. They may not agree with your interpretation. They may not agree with what you say. But what they can't deny is the amount of time and energy and research you put in to really look at these issues, what the Bible really says, original translations, context, uh, historical context, spiritual context. And, uh, and I think people would do themselves a favor to remember that, to consider that, before they knee-jerk to disagree um, uh, or, uh, or scurry to cry, you know, heretic or whatever, uh, or non-biblical. Um, that's just not an argument. We, they can disagree, and we don't have a problem with, being, with, with people disagreeing, uh, but uh, what they can't say is that we don't know the Bible mm -hmm. and that we don't refer to the Bible for our truth because um, that's all you've done. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for one, appreciate that, and I, I would just encourage people to uh, remember that uh, and, and to think about that when they're examining these ideas. Thank, thank you for that. I appreciate that.